minimally invasive esophagectomy, the Brigham and Women's Hospital Experience. We present a case of a 68-year-old gentleman with a history of dysphagia and a 15-pound weight loss. The barium swallow study demonstrated a partial distal obstruction and the endoscopy demonstrated a large distal mass that was friable. Pathology was consistent with a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, HER2 new positive. At a CT scan, the distal esophageal mass that measured 6.5 by 4.2 by 4.1 centimeters and the EUS demonstrated a T3 NX lesion. PET CT scan demonstrated a distal esophageal mass with an SUV of 13.5 and hence, he was started on a neo adjuvant chemo radiotherapy treatment with cisplatin and etoposide and 50 40 centigrades. He suddenly got a repeat PET CT scan that demonstrated persistent SUV avidity in those distal esophagus but no distant lesions, and hence, we planned for a minimally invasive fiber Lewis esophagectomy. Our initial approach begins in the abdomen laparoscopically. We identify the greater curvature in, and we try to keep a fairly large omental skirt that we can later use as our omental patch. We get into the lesser sac laterally and begin to extend this up towards the short gastrics. Being careful to note where the gastroepiploic artery is to make sure we stay away from the And to make sure we stay away from the gastric wall. I'm sorry, and as we get up to the, the short wall, gastrics, we actually get closer to the gastric wall so that we stay fairly close to the stomach. We see here uh, approaching now the lesser curvature and taking down to a gastropathic ligament and working our way up to the right cruise. There may be an occasional replaced left hepatic which needs to be divided. We further dissect it up into the hiatus and we get some distal esophageal mobility. Make sure we have some circumferential mobility around the distal esophagus. And then now began to expose the left gastric artery. You can take down all the omental attachments here so that this area is fairly isolated. We can, if desired, skeletonize this area. And we make sure that the gastroepiploic is preserved all the way down to the gastroduodenal area. We then take a vascular stapler and place it along the base of the left gastric artery, making sure we take all the lymph node tissue with us. And extend it up into the hiatal opening. And then begin to form our gastric conduit, starting with division of the lesser curvature vasculature, and then forming our gastric conduit in multiple fires of the stapler. Make sure we have about a four centimeter diameter from the greater curvature wall to our now staple line. We do put some retraction on the stomach to make sure that the conduit itself is extended. Usually it takes about seven to eight staple loads to go across the entire length. We make sure that the tip is well perfused. And if so, we then attach the specimen to our tip of our gastric conduit, making sure of the orientation so that the staple line remains on the right of the specimen, uh, which we can verify once we pull it up into the chest. Usually two sutures are placed here to make sure the orientation remains intact. Once this is all tied, we check our conduit one more time before proceeding up into the thoracic cavity. Here we have the patient in their left lateral decubitus position and we're dissecting the esophagus away from the mediastinum, carefully dividing all the subclinal nodal tissue so that it stays with the specimen. Though you can resect this separately, our preferential method is to do it on block. We then divide the esophagus away from the posterior mediastinum, making sure not to injure the thoracic duct. We will at times clip a lot of these branches the harmonic works well as well. We also extend this all the way up to the thoracic inlet. Above the level of the acicus vein, we do try to keep a pleural tent, which can ultimately cover the anastomosis. We try to extend this as high as possible, making sure to protect the airway. We then deliver the conduit and the specimen into the thoracic cavity, making sure we keep the orientation of the staple line onto our side. You can see here as the gastric conduit gets pulled up, 
we try not to pull a, a, and then an extended amount of length into the chest just enough so that it'll stay and then we obviously divide the suture so it separates the specimen and the conduit. Once this has been separated, we'll check the esophagus again. And if it's fully mobilized, we then divide the proximal esophagus sharply with endoshears to fully resect the specimen and avail the remaining esophagus for the anastomosis. It's quite important to make sure that you are aware of the angle of approach and then try to get a flush, flat uh, end. You can certainly extend this uh, high into the thoracic cavity if needed, depending on the location of your tumor. Once this is completely divided, the posterior inferior incision is extended by a couple centimeters and the wound protector placed and the specimen delivered through the cerean center pathology. You can get some bleeding and you can use cautery if preferred. Once the specimen has been delivered, the end of the esophagus is examined. Occasionally we will dilate this with a uh, Foley balloon catheter. However, if the uh, opening is adequate, we'll tend to use an EEA stapler for anastomosis. 25 and 28 millimeter EEAs are the most common sizes utilized. The EEA is placed into the opening and two Pershing sutures are placed to snugly close the esophagus around the anvil. The initial stitch is a baseball type stitch to make sure that you get the mucosa snugly around the anvil. There are different techniques for this portion. Some pay, uh, surgeons uh, opt to put these in before cutting the esophagus. Our preference is to do this after as we can see the mucosa better. Once you've completely gotten around the opening, this will be tied down. This is tied so that the knot is exterior. We then put a second purse string exterior to the initial purse string such that we can cinch the esophagus around the base of the anvil so that we know we have a flat surface for the anastomosis to be formed. Just make sure that the esophagus itself is snugly placed around the anvil without any gaps that could cause a leak or an opening along the anastomosis. You can clearly see that the anvil is snugly around. We then take the gastric conduit and pull a little bit more up. We divide the proximal staple line to open into the, uh, the conduit.
We opened along the staple line distally where we had placed our sutures. Uh, this area will be resected in the near future. The opening has to be large enough to accept the handle of the EEA stapler. Gently place it over the handle and the handle is advanced into a slightly more distal portion of the conduit and the spike brought out along the line of the greater curve. We then attach the anvil, making sure it clicks together, and gently bring the esophagus down from the upper chest, and also push the gastric conduit up to meet the anastomosis. This slight tension will keep the conduit straight and in the mediastinum. The stapler is fired, forming an osmosis. We then have the anesthesiologist gently advance the NG tube, which we can often observe. And this open end of the conduit is then now stapled off. We try to keep the line with the ongoing staple line on the conduit. but then resect this candy cane portion of the conduit. We need to make sure there's at least about a centimeter of space between this staple line and the anastomosis staple line. I then cover up the entirety of the staple line with our omentum to form our mental patch. You suture it onto the edges of the pleura up above and then often to the mediastinum more inferiorly. The chest is then copiously irrigated. You can see that the entirety of this conduit is covered up with momentum to protect it. We place a couple chest tubes in the chest cavity for drainage. And the case is complete. Post-op, patients are started on J2 feeds on day three. On day five, they undergo a bear and swallow study to make sure there's no leak. And they're usually discharged around day seven on two feed support with an oral liquid diet. On subsequent follow-up, once they've advanced on their normal diet, their two feeds are discontinued at six weeks. And follow-up CT scans are usually every four to six months based on ultimate pathology. Thank you.